let's start it off. You have a new report out, yes. Control Crisis. Mm -hmm. If you could tell me a little bit about, you know, just all the people that were involved with that, mm -hmm. and you know what exactly the goals were and yeah. what you learned so far. Thank you for and thank you for taking the time to, to chat. So it started during the political during the campaign in 2017. I spent a lot of time knocking on doors. And one of the things I noticed was in, there was a clear sort of difference between some buildings and other buildings, where in certain apartment buildings you had long-term residents that had been there for 30, 40 years, and then building next door you might see relatively new residents. And I'd always ask people, hey, what's the number one issue you're dealing with? And for many of the long-term residents, they said, I feel like my landlord's trying to push me out, um, I can't get any repairs done. And so it, I kind of made a mental note, hey, I really want to dig in and understand what's going on once I get into office. And obviously it took a little bit of time to uh, you know, uh, get going, but then what we did is my council office, so myself, uh, my council aide Laura, uh, Sarah Ligon who's a volunteer, and Amanda Luchin who is our graduate intern, uh, we all kind of got together and then said, hey, we want to try to comprehensively understand what's happening with rent control in Ward E, those long-term residents who have been there, what's going on. So we did a three kind of pronged approach. The first was try to do a data analysis to get a list of all the rent controlled units. And we don't have a 100% correct list, but we think we're in the 95% range of understanding all the rent controlled units in downtown. Second thing was let's talk to people in their buildings and try to understand what's going on. So we did door knocking and a survey. And then the last was let's analyze the data at the city level where the landlords have to submit rent registrations. And our overall conclusion of this was we think the system is broken, it's not working as intended. And that's because tenants don't even know they're in rent control and landlords feel as if the rules don't apply, at least many of them do. And that creates a system where rents are not protected and tenants are pushed out. Okay, so one of the things that I keep on seeing in the report yeah. was the term value and commodity when mm -hmm. we're talking about the actual rent control unit mm -hmm. itself. How do you quantify or qualify that value? Of what that means to the city? Of, of what you mean when you say valuable commodity. Like you, you oh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Like, yep. mm -hmm. Because obviously there's a social aspect to it. Yep. And there's an economic aspect, so I'm trying to just yeah. you know, see how, how we how we get to that. The definition, I yeah. See that term thrown in there a lot. Yeah, I, what we mean very much is I think the the social benefit to downtown of remaining a community that is not it's not what it once was, but still maintains some of the diversity that it once had, and I think that makes it a special place to be. So. For me, you know, as part of just the pol my policy agenda broadly, is I want to see more affordable housing built in downtown because it lets residents who have been here for many years stay as prices generally increase. And so for me, finding hundreds of units, I mean, finding they exist, but for me to analyze hundreds of units of housing at rents that are genuinely affordable for your average person, $700 a month, $800 a month, that to me provides real value both to that person and to the community at large. As far as the yeah. economic side, so I understand yeah. where you're coming from from the social side. Yeah. From the economic side, what would you say that you've learned is the average rent that, that the rent control that people, like I say, that mm -hmm. are doing the right thing? So we have certain landlords, obviously, you're not saying right. everybody's doing this. Right. You have certain landlords that mm -hmm. are adhering to the rent control of the Correct. people living in rent control. What is their average rent that you've learned so far? So the average rent, and this included everybody who filled out a rent registration for 2017. So it may not include people that aren't following the rules and didn't fill in the rules. The, the, I think it's in the median rent, I should say, I believe was right over $1,300 a month in the $1,300, $1,400 a month range, um, which obviously is, I think, certainly lower than the, the median rent would be uh, at the market rate, uh, but also it's higher than what we would consider an affordable unit if the general definition is, without getting too wonky, 80% AMI, and that was at 2017 at the 1200, uh, 1100, 1200 range. For certain tenants who have lived in their unit basically for a very long period of time, we saw rents in the range of sort of six to eight hundred dollars, six to nine hundred dollars. But then we found, you know, apartment buildings where either the laws haven't been properly followed or they exist in this gray area, and those rents we saw oftentimes above two thousand. So I think um, we saw rents of roughly fifteen to twenty percent of units above two thousand dollars a month, which given the way the rent control rules are written, is it's, very, it's not impossible to get there legally, but it certainly raises a lot of red flags for us. Um, as far as, uh, so we're talking yeah. about identifying the number of units. How many units yeah. overall was it 
that you calculated were supposed to be in the run control. 1,151, and I, you know, put a little plus or minus of you know 50 either way, but that's the number we came to. And then you're saying from the report, I, I learned that about 50% yeah. of those are filled by people who moved within the last seven years. Correct. Yes. So, so in reality, we're talking about 550 units mm -hmm. at the value of the social aspect, where we have that kind of community mm -hmm. and. Essentially, that's what that is, would you say that's who we're trying to target with this report as far as helping them and uplifting? Yeah, I mean, what we're trying to, because. Oh, you're trying to, excuse me. I mean. No, no, agreed. I, I, but yes. So part of what we're trying to say is because we think we weren't following the rules, we, the city wasn't doing a good enough job of enforcing them, we lost some of those units, right? So maybe had in 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, we've been following the rules closely, had a better system of landlord tenant relations. We might not have lost a lot of those units, but correct, in terms of the social value of what those units provide to downtown, the main group is the long-term residents that are here, uh, who've been here for a long time. And you know, I think you could roughly argue that that's in the, roughly the 50% range of the units we found. So yeah. my, my question is this, so you mm -hmm. have the landlord that's been uh, obviously right. flagrantly violating according to you what, yeah. what the, rent, the rent control laws yeah. of Jersey City and how they were supposed to work. And right. you, you had kind of, I, I would suppose it's more of an outlier with the 5,000. Sure. You know, uh, it's, but, but it's, it's a big outlier. Yeah, it's a big outlier, yeah. but you know, it's worth talking about. But we're talking right. about there's probably, the, the issue is probably more in that 2,000 or 3,000 range. Of, yeah. I would take a lucky guess. Yeah. And my question is, right. Those people that are in those units, there's no going back. There's no like saying we're going to go, we're going to go get the, the 250, right. you know, uh, long-term residents sure. from you know that up until 2011 or right. 2012, we're, we're bringing them back. Right. How do you deal with that situation? Mm -hmm. We've got two parties that consented to that, and now you know, do we roll it back for the for the person that could afford the three thousand dollars a month rent and to right. kind of punish the landlord and show people, or are, are we? I guess more pragmatic about you know where the market is right now. Sure, it's a great question, and I think you're getting at a key issue, which rent control is not a perfect policy. First, to acknowledge that, and one of the issues is it's not as well targeted as you'd like. So, someone who could benefit from from it is a new person moving in who's now getting a below market rate rent, but who hasn't been a long term resident and might not even have an affordable income. Um, so, what can we do about that? You know, I think we can try to be creative. Uh, we can potentially try to rewrite some of the rules so that you know, potentially there are ways in which the landlord and the city can work together and find ways to transfer money into affordable housing that might be better targeted. So I, I think we can be creative, but I think it has to start with us enforcing the rules because if we don't enforce the rules, there's no incentive for a landlord to work with the city. The landlord's just going to say, well, look, what I can do is I can push somebody out and probably use illegal and nefarious methods because there's no enforcement of it. Then I'm going to push that long-term tenant out, going to knock them out, then I'm going to do capital repairs, but I'm not going to submit the receipts to the city because there's a loophole that allows them to do that. And then I'm going to raise the rent, $1,000, and then I'm not going to tell the new tenant that he's rent controlled, so maybe I'm going to raise the rent above when I'm allowed the next couple years and hope he doesn't figure out. So could some of those long term no, sorry, so could some of those new tenants file for an illegal rent increase? They could. And I and I, we would encourage them to do so because just frankly we don't think the rules have been followed. But then is there a way for us to sit down and, and maybe craft a, a more creative policy solution? I think possibly, but you can't do that unless you're starting with real enforcement. So they're talking yeah. about real enforcement and uh, I guess this is maybe a little bit more on the philosophical end of things. Sure. But we're talking about more regulations, obviously. Yep. More regulations, more enforcement to yeah. kind of, I guess, seek some type yeah. of fairness mm -hmm. in the local market. Yeah. My only question is, is there a point where the, the landlords, I mean, they have certain abilities right now, they could do condo conversions and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Does it concern you if there's only 500 of these units that are in play? Right. Because we're not talking about the long-term ones that's been working, we'll mm -hmm. talk about just the 500 on the other side. Sure. The, of units that you mm -hmm. know, guys haven't been the best actors and whatnot. What if they right. say, you know what, I've cashed out, I've made all this money, mm -hmm. this guy James Solomon in the city, <laughs> they're coming for me, you know, right. screw this, I'm gonna convert these into condos and right. sell them right now. Obviously there's some issues in the market as far as yep. property taxes and everything, but yeah. do you see that as, as you know, an unintended consequence yeah. of, of what might happen? Uh, so I think you could get some of that, but I do think there are some constraints to how much you're gonna see of that. So first, New Jersey's condo conversion law is reasonably um, strict. So it, it, at a minimum, you have to 
apply, you have to fill out a bunch of paperwork, and then there's a minimum of a three-year period before you can turn it into a condo, and you have to give the current tenants protections, and if those tenants are low income, they're actually permanently protected in the unit, even if you turn it into a condo. So I think we have some pretty strong protections, but even with that said, sure, some landlords could try to take, to take us down that path. So I do want to be careful when we think about the new regulations, but what I would also say is, simply enforcing the rules on the books, they, these rules have basically been on the books now for 30 plus years. Most of these buildings are new owners, not all, but most. So most of these guys knew what they were getting into when they bought. They knew what the rules in the system and the program was, and I think simply by us enforcing those rules, again, we'll actually be in a better position to then draft any future legislation. All right, so you, yeah. you talked a little bit about just rent control as an overall policy. Yeah. You, you said that you know, it's not the perfect policy, but right. it's something that we have in place. Yeah. We're talking about right now preserving about like 550 to 600 units mm -hmm. for people that have been here a long, long time. Correct. And this is obviously whatever policies you're implementing is yeah. going to be having a citywide effect. Mm -hmm. The city has an affordable housing crisis. Can you just, from the top of your head, from yeah. the numbers that you've seen, I'm sure you've seen numbers right. over, what would you say the, uh, the, the need is uh, as far as people that we're talking about 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 people right now that you would say are in an affordable housing crisis? It's, it's a good question. So I was looking at the data. You, I think it's, so I think roughly a fourth, one fourth of all Jersey City residents are severely in, in a housing crisis. Um, you know, one in every four, and that means they're paying upwards of 50% of their income on rent. And I think that's particularly true for the, you know, folks who are low income, um, you know, incomes of 50K or less. That's where we see the biggest gap in housing. We don't have those units as much on the market anymore. And that's where I would love for us to see, and part of what I saw in this report was when you see rents of, of five, six hundred dollars a month, that's genuinely affordable. Even for some of the 80-20 projects that we've done, so some of the new affordable housing, the rent is 1200 And 1200 is great, don't get me wrong, it was, that can be a huge benefit to somebody, but a lot of people 1200 you can't afford. So if you see a rent at 600 that's really important. And I do think the lesson for the rest of the city, hopefully from this report, is that as rents start to increase, market rents, there's gonna be greater incentive for some landlords to try to engage in the same types of tactics they use downtown to try to push people out and increase rents in their rent controlled buildings. So hopefully it serves as a warning call to the rest of the city to say, hey, we've really got to be on top of these regulations and these rules uh, to make sure that those affordable units in newly gentrifying parts of the city are preserved. You speak a little bit about the newly gentrifying, yeah. uh, and, and we're, yeah. we're going to talk a little bit, go back to rent control for a second, sure. but in these newly gentrifying areas per se, yeah. we talk about uh, the Bergen Lafayette, mm -hmm. uh, West Bergen, whatever that is, West of Kennedy Boulevard. I, I don't know either. These names get interesting <laughs> for me, I'm not, you know, yeah, I, I just, I go with the flow. Um, my question yeah. is, you see, yeah. a lot of homes in there yeah. are one to four families, mm -hmm. so they're not even involved Correct. in rent control, and you have kind of mega companies, including right. we have Dixon. Sure. Uh, Dixon is a billion dollar Australian mm -hmm. fund that's buying up yeah. one to four family homes in Greenville right mm -hmm. now. And kind of, we're talking about rent control as, mm -hmm. as is kind of fighting, you know, oh, mm -hmm. we fight on for a couple units here and there. Are we not, are, 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 are the city council, mm -hmm. are, are, you know, from uh, just from a critical perspective, are, are they losing the focus of, of the mm -hmm. overall issue of affordable, affordability in Jersey City, thinking of it as a marketplace versus specific subsidized units of housing? I mean, I think you have to think about it both at the same time. So as a marketplace, which is a important thing about that, the ongoing challenge we have is we're part of the greater New York marketplace. So as much as we can sort of try to adjust policies that affect the overall housing market, we're always going to be impacted by what's happening in New York. So I mean, downtown, we've I don't have the exact numbers, but you know, I think we've roughly added you know, 20% increase in our housing supply in the last decade. It's a rough estimate. I could be wrong a little bit one way or the other, but that's huge. I mean, imagine if New York added 20% of its housing supply. And you would imagine that that would lower rents, but because we've just sort of kind of sucked up the demand from New York, it hasn't lowered our rents. In fact, it's increased them by changing the neighborhood and uh, encouraging more folks to move in. So, I, but I, so I don't, we can't lose sight, though, that we have an overall housing marketplace. You have billion-dollar investors finding profits. So I think what you have to do is, is two things at the same time. One is increase supply, try to overall have a market that's going to create middle-class homes. 
and then also find specific subsidized programs where you can protect units. So can you know, we think about inclusionary zoning, we think about Bayfront, we think about a couple other projects. So if you can maybe get 5,000 units of protected housing through specific programs and then you improve the market, I think that's the best path you're getting towards. But the one thing I would say, and, and this is being wonky and not political, but as long as we're deeply connected to New York, we're never gonna, I think, solve the problem, right? We can't, there's some bigger market forces that I just don't think we have control over. See, and, and I find that interesting yeah. uh, because I, I, yeah. I think this is where we kind of have a disagreement a little sure. bit. And, yeah. and the issue in you know, the perspective I kind of want to bring right here in this interview is, yeah. is that I agree with you. Right. Nobody, I think anybody yeah. that's being serious about the housing right. affordability crisis in Jersey City has mm -hmm. to be honest that this is an issue that's driven by people in New York that are probably mm -hmm. making anywhere from 100000 to $200,000 a year right. that are saying, you know what, we're getting a deal in Jersey City paying these crazy rent prices. Right. Because they were it's better. In New York. Yeah, it's yeah. better than what they were paying. It, it's yeah. as simple as that. And, and my yeah. question is, and, and this is something I brought up yeah. during the education debate, sure. and I kind of want to bring it up again, is that we're talking, like I said, going back to the marketplace, mm -hmm. that demand, the mm -hmm. pressure is crazy right now. Mm -hmm. There's so many people from New York that, that mm -hmm. they see Jersey City with those salaries and mm -hmm. why this is like an affordable paradise. Like mm -hmm. I can get this brownstone for 340000 in this neighborhood that in five years, look at all this development that's going on. Yeah. Nothing like you've seen. Mm -hmm. Putting an income tax. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'd probably hit Wardy the hardest if there was a sure. citywide income tax, a progressive one, uh, you know, maybe capping at one percent yeah. or something. Although, let's yeah. be honest, Wardy voted seven to one for Phil Murphy over at they, they did. So if they, we're not talking about people that wouldn't necessarily be that would be against yeah. this. But do you see that as potentially being a tool that could be in place to cool off the demand in the housing market in Jersey City to say, hey, listen, somebody coming from New York mm -hmm. that one percent if they're making one hundred and fifty thousand might not be appeasing. Mm -hmm you know, and slowing down that demand. You see that as possibly being a tool. Sure. I mean, I think we should have to consider sort of a range of options. It, obviously, the state kind of right now doesn't allow us to, to, they only allow us to do property taxes and they just passed the payroll tax and a couple other smaller taxes. So we wouldn't be able to do it as of today. But I think we should look at kind of every tool that's an option to us. And I do think an income tax could help deal with the school funding crisis. New York City has one. Um, a couple other cities have them as well. Um, you want to think about it in context with the payroll tax as well. But I certainly would be willing to consider it and look at a whole bunch of other options for us.